All right, uh, this video lecture is for chapter one, section two, matter and its properties. The objectives for this section, so at the end of this section, you should be able to distinguish between the physical properties and chemical properties of matter. You should be able to distinguish, I'm sorry, uh, classify changes of matter as either physical or chemical. You should also be able to explain the gas, liquid, and solid states in terms of the particles as well as being able to distinguish between a mixture and a pure substance. Uh, we're going to start talking about the properties uh, and changes in matter. Some of the things we're going to point out uh, during this particular part are the extensive versus intensive properties, as well as the chemical versus uh, physical properties. So intensive versus extensive. Uh, extensive properties, they depend on the amount of matter present. So uh, if you have a small amount of uh, whatever, you're, whatever you're looking at, you know, graphite, gold, if you have a small amount of it, your extensive properties will change based on how much you have. Intensive, it essentially does not depend on the amount of matter. It really just depends on what substance you're looking at. It depends on the identity of the substance, not the amount. So in order to better understand this, let's look at some examples. Uh, boiling point, is it an extensive or intensive property? Well, it's intensive. It depends on the uh, substance that you're trying to boil, or you're trying to turn into vapor. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of that substance, you'll need to add uh, a lot of energy. However, the temperature at which it will boil is uh, uh, characteristic of the substance. Uh, volume is extensive because if you had a, a lot of something, it's going to take up more volume. Right? If you have a small amount of it, it's going to take up less volume. So that's an extensive property. Mass, again, extensive. Right? Uh, if I have a thousand eggs, I'll have more egg mass than if I had one egg. And it doesn't change uh, based on the eggs or the types of eggs itself. Uh, density is an intensive property. Different substances have characteristic densities, and the density will not change based on how much you have. Uh, conductivity, okay, and, and uh, later section we'll talk about conductivity. Uh, it's basically uh, a substance's ability to uh, move uh, electric current or heat through it, and that is an intensive property. Okay, we'll find that uh, metals are, are very good conductors, and uh, for lack of a better explanation, they're good conductors because they are metals. All right? So it, it depends on the substance itself, not how much you have. All right, physical versus chemical properties. A physical property is a property that you can observe without changing the identity of the substance. Now, that's not super clear by itself, so let's throw out the definition for a chemical property because that'll make it make a little more sense. Uh, a chemical property uh, describes the ability of a substance to undergo, undergo uh, changes in its identity. All right. So if you're looking at a particular characteristic or property of something, if you can look at it, if you can see it in action without the chemical changing, that's a physical property. And if the chemical does change, uh, it's a chemical property. All right, uh, again, it's better to understand this by looking at some examples. A melting point, the point at which something will uh, change from a solid state to a liquid state, is a physical change. Okay, it's a physical change, right? You have uh, solid water, ice, changing into liquid water. Okay, it's still water. It, the fact that it is water, H2O, has not changed, so that's simply a physical change. If something's flammable or not, that's going to be a chemical property. Because in order to observe whether or not something is flammable, you need to set it on fire, essentially. And once you burn something, you're causing a chemical change, a change in uh, its identity. Uh, density, that is a physical characteristic, a physical, or a physical property. You can measure that, you can, you can observe that by putting something on a scale, and it does not change the nature of that substance. I, myself, I can step on a scale, uh, see how overweight I am. However, I'm still me, and I'm still overweight and sad. Um, magnetism. If something's magnetic, yeah, that is a physical 
uh, physical property. When you see uh, something's attraction or repulsion to some sort of magnetic substance, it doesn't change the substance as you're watching it become magnetized. Um, tarnishes in air, some sort of rust or oxidation reaction, that's going to be a chemical change. As, again, as we'll learn in a future section, rust itself is uh, uh, an oxidation reaction where you're actually taking oxygen and you're shoving it onto something uh, and so it's becoming an oxide and so you're changing the identity of the substance. <clears throat> All right, so uh, changes, if you're looking at a, a change, if you're trying to identify the reaction uh, as uh, physical or chemical, if it's a physical change, the change uh, is going to change the form, not the identity. You know, the form, not the identity. Uh, the, the substance itself will stay the same. Therefore, the properties will stay the same, as opposed to a chemical change in which uh, there is a change in identity. Okay? The substance itself has changed, okay? and that's going to be uh, the true uh, you know, choice there. Did you see a change in substance or not? Okay? Um, there are some signs that a chemical change has gone on. Okay, if you see a change in color or a smell, some sort of odor. Also, if there's a formation or evolution of a gas. Uh, if there's a formation of a precipitate, some sort of solid uh, that wasn't there before. Uh, it's an interesting thing to watch when you have two liquids mixed together. Chemical reaction ensues and all of a sudden there's a, there's a solid at the bottom of your test tube. Uh, if there's any change in light or heat, if light is generated or if heat is generated, you know, that's a telltale sign that there's been a chemical change. All right, so let's see if we can identify these examples. Rusting iron. That's a chemical change, right? It's an oxidation reaction. You have iron, Fe, is becoming oxidized by, by O, oxygen. And so instead of iron metal, you have uh, some sort of iron oxide. So the identity has changed, that's a chemical change. If you dissolve something in water, that's simply a physical change, like when you mix salt into water. Okay? The, uh, it's still H2O and it's still NaCl. Those two things have not changed, they're just mixed together. That's a physical change. If you burn a log, however, if you combust wood, that's a chemical change. You're changing that wood into something that it was not before. Uh, melting ice, again, it's an example I used when I was actually talking about the definition. That's a physical change. The fact that it's water, H2O, has not changed. It's simply changing uh, uh, states. When you grind spice, that's a physical change. You're taking the spices that you had, and you're simply mechanically breaking them into smaller bits. So it's still the same spice, just smaller bits. All right, uh, now let's move on to talking about states of matter again. Uh, I want to emphasize you will be doing a quick ride on this. The goal here is explain the gas, liquid, and solid states in terms of particles. Okay, that's going to be a new thing, I'm sure, for you, talking about particles. And in order uh, to assist you in that, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the kinetic molecular theory uh, and how it relates to the states of matter. Okay, so the kinetic molecular theory, sometimes abbreviated KMT, states simply that all particles of matter are in motion. Always. Okay? They never stop. Okay? Uh, the point at which they would stop completely is something that is known as absolute zero, which is something that doesn't happen in nature. So uh, in nature, things are always, always in motion. The extent to which they're in motion is what uh, gives us some characteristics, some properties to observe. Uh, one thing that you'll want to uh, just be very, very familiar with, not really have to think about it, but just become second nature, is when we increase the temperature of a particular system or, or this group of molecules, the, the kinetic energy of the molecules will increase. And in, in some ways, thinking about that kinetic energy as the speed of those molecules is going to help you conceptualize these different states of matter. Now, there are three common states of matter, but there are actually four uh, that we can describe fairly easily here. <clears throat> uh, the first one being solids. Again, we're going to talk about this in terms of how much kinetic energy uh, these things have. So it has a very low kinetic energy. The particles are, are in a fixed shape and a fixed volume. Okay? Uh, they, they, they cannot move around. They're fixed together and it's very, very, uh, very static. However, the particles are still moving. 
right? Now, if they can't move around, right, which is why it has a fixed shape or a fixed volume, how can they be moving? It's simply a, a vibration, okay? They're vibrating around a fixed point, okay? But they can't break that particular structure. Liquids, while they still have a fixed volume, their shape can change. So they can take the shape of whatever, whatever container they're in. They still have a fairly low kinetic energy, but the particles can now uh, move around. Okay? They still have to stay in contact, very close to one another, but they can move around. Um, they still have to stay close to one another. That's why that volume is, is fixed. That doesn't change. But now the fact that they can move around, they don't have to be around a fixed point, as in a solid. Now they can actually change their shape. Once we get into the gas phase, we start seeing fairly high kinetic energies. Uh, the kinetic energies are so high that they can actually, uh, the particles can move away from each other and start moving uh, around on their own. They can move throughout whatever container they're in. And so because they can move around whatever container they're in and not really care about staying in contact with the other molecules in the container, now you have a variable shape and a variable, variable volume. Uh, the fourth state of matter is not super common on this planet. However, it's a very uh, common throughout the universe. Uh, plasma okay, is very, very high kinetic energy. Uh, this is the type of uh, matter that needs to be present if you're going to see something like uh, nuclear fusion stars or an actual star to, to be born. Uh, the, the kinetic energy, the speed of these particles is so high that these particles can collide with enough energy uh, uh, to fuse, to say the least, but um, for what we want to talk about the fact that they uh, become charged particles is what we're looking for, the, the more important part here. Now, plasma tends to be very gas-like uh, because it, it has a variable shape and a variable uh, volume. However, it's, it's at a whole other level of kinetic energy compared to gas. Um, I say these things are very common in the universe because it's what stars are made of. That's, that's star matter. And uh, for those of you who have had a background in earth science or astronomy, you realize that um, our solar system, for example, is about 98% uh, our star by mass. If we consider all the mass in our solar system, 98% of it is our star. So that's actually much more common than a solid liquid or gas. Uh, we also see uh, plasma in fluorescent light bulbs or CRTs, cathode ray tubes, old time TVs or old time monitors. Uh, last thing we want to talk about in this uh, section uh, classification of matter. And I'm what I'm going to put on the, the screen here is a flow chart uh, of how to distinguish uh, between uh, different kinds of matter. Now the flow chart I have, uh, I'm going to put on the screen is going to be uh, more specific and more distinctions than you're going to need to know for, uh, for your quiz and your test. However, uh, we're going to do it. All right. So I'm going to throw up a, a matter flow chart. This is something that I would suggest that you copy down in your notes and you can use it to help uh, quiz yourself later. Uh, the flowchart is going to help us talk about pure substances versus mixtures. All right, so here's that flowchart. Again, we're asking, all right, it's matter. Ask yourself, can it be physically separated? If yes, if you can separate the matter, it's a mixture. Okay, If you can separate it from it, it's a mixture. All right, and if not, that means it's a pure substance. All right, if, if you can, if you can uh, separate out something uh, like granite, uh, the different, the different uh, components of granite, you can separate those out. That's a mixture. Okay? But a pure substance, something like water, there's nothing to separate out. It's just, it's just a whole bunch of water. All right, so if you're looking at a, a mixture, you ask, is the composition uniform? Meaning if you were to split that granite in half, is there any chance that you know the the chunk on your left is going to be different in composition than the chunk on your right, right? Uh, if it, if it is uniform in composition, it's referred to as a homogeneous mixture. Okay, uh, homo meaning same, genus referring to uh, a group. It's the same group of stuff. It's a uniform composition. Uh, if not, you consider it heterogeneous. Again, hetero meaning different, genus meaning group. It's a, it's a different group made of different things. Now, if we're looking at a, at a pure substance, you want to ask yourself, can it be chemically decomposed, right? 
uh, water, you can actually decompose it into its constituents, hydrogen and oxygen. And that would make water a compound because you can decompose them. However, if you take something like hydrogen gas or, 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 uh, or a carbon, some sort of carbon source like graphite or, or diamond, uh, can you decompose those things chemically? Then no, it's, it's, it's going to be a pure element. It's just, it's just carbon. It's just carbon. All right, so uh, let's look at some examples here. Graphite is an element. Oh, it looks like you don't have um, animations on this slide. Uh, graphite, it's an element. It's just carbon. It's pure carbon. Pepper is a mixture. Okay, it's, it's, it's different, uh, different compounds in there that can be separated. Also, you can, you can take uh, a bunch of pepper separate it out and you'll actually have different amounts of the substances that make up pepper in either hand. Uh, when you when you go in and like take a handful of pepper, okay, if you have just like a huge vat of it, take that handful, take a second handful, it's going to be a different proportion of, of compounds in there. So that's a heterogeneous uh, mixture. Uh, if we look at sugar, something like sucrose, that's going to be a compound. It's going to be uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So all those things could be decomposed. Okay? The, uh, sugar can be burned. It could be uh, combusted. That's one of the things you do in cellular respiration. Uh, paint okay, is most certainly a heterogeneous mixture. It has a lot of different chemicals in it, and you can separate those things out. Uh, soda water. Soda water is going to be a solution. Okay? You're just going to have water and you're just going to throw in some carbon dioxide to make a soda water. All right? Those things don't combine. Okay? They just physically combine. They don't chemically combine. So that's just a solution. Uh, examples of pure substances, uh, things like copper wire, aluminum foil, uh, they're, they're just copper, just aluminum atoms. That's all they are. So that's an elemental substance. Uh, the other kind of pure substance is going to be a compound composed of two or more elements in some sort of fixed ratio. Yeah, remember, a definite composition, a lot of definite composition. Uh, it's going to be on the next slide. Uh, but properties differ from those of individual elements. All right? Example being uh, table salt. If you take sodium by itself or, or chlorine by itself, they have very different characteristics alone compared to when you combine them okay, into sodium chloride or table salt, which is... Uh, something that makes my food delicious. In law of definite composition, uh, a given compound always contains the same fixed ratio of elements. It's always the same ratio. If it's a different ratio, it's a different compound. Uh, law of multiple proportions is something uh, that came a little bit later. Elements can combine in different ratios to form different compounds. For example, uh, if we have something like uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, they're both carbon and oxygen. The only difference here is what ratio. Okay, is the ratio of carbon to oxygen 1 to 1, or is it 1 to 2 as it is in carbon dioxide? So uh, the fact that these have different ratios means that they're two different compounds because they have two different compositions. Looking at uh, mixtures... <coughs> Mixtures, you have a, a varying combination of two or more pure substances. So we have to take something that's pure. It truly is a pure substance, but we have to mix them together uh, in some sort of uh, uh, physical change. And we have the example here, th this rock in the bottom left. That's a heterogeneous mixture uh, of lots of different chemicals uh, that your neighborhood geologists can tell you about, but I can't really. Um, but on the right here, we have this picture of delicious apple juice, which is a homogeneous mixture. Okay? It, the, the first sip is going to be the exact same as the last sip. Okay? What you drink at the top of the glass will not change by the time you get to the bottom of the glass. It's all the same throughout the glass. Uh, mixtures, uh, there are uh, solutions. You have homogeneous uh, solutions. They have very, very small particles. Um, there's no Tyndall effect. That's something that we'll talk about in class. Uh, the particles don't settle, so they won't uh, separate out uh, very, very easily. One example would be rubbing alcohol. Okay? Uh, um, rubbing alcohol is a solution. Uh, you can read it all, 
directly on the label, okay? And it'll tell you exactly uh, what constitutes that solution. All right, and there are uh, two different kinds of uh, these sorts of mixtures. We have uh, colloid and suspension mixtures. Uh, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on these, but just in case uh, this is something you're wanting to pursue, I'm going to throw up some examples of each, mayonnaise being uh, colloid, muddy water being suspension, fog colloid, uh, salt water sol uh, solution, and then uh, your good old Italian dressing is going to be uh, something like a suspension. So again, uh, you have uh, a couple of different assignments to complete based on this particular section. You have your section review questions as well as your vocabulary list and uh, the due dates have been established in class. Again, your objectives here, which you're supposed to get between this video lecture and the reading itself. You want to be able to distinguish between the physical properties and the chemical properties of matter. You want to be able to classify changes of matter as either physical or chemical. You want to be able to explain the gas, liquid, and solid states in terms of particles. Again, there will be a quick write on that. Uh, and distinguish between a mixture and a pure substance. So uh, I hope that helped. Uh, be sure after you watch this, write down any questions that you might have so you can bring them up in class. All right, I'll see you next period.